Renowing the two in one nature of reality through a daily experience of visualizations, songs, prayers, and offerings is the foundation of the spiritual way of life. No wonder the Navajos and Tibetans pointedly insist that theirs is not a religion but a way of life. Likewise, it is no coincidence that both traditions are called paths or ways since these titles reveal the sense of a process or journey. So in the journey we have the goal, but in order to attain the goal we must have properly initiated the journey. The spiritual traveler begins by breaking free from the suffering disorder of habitual reality and strives for the ideal state of being beyond it. Not being a Gautama Buddha or a Navajo dreamer, most of us need terrestrial guidance. This comes through the person of a lama or chanter who is steeped in the vast body of wisdom and psycho-spiritual techniques. The master facilitates the journey by linking the individual with an idealized version of that reality beyond, yet within the ordinary self. After sloughing off the counterproductive aspects of one's self-identity through ritualized purification, one is ready to become identified with an ideal role model, be it deity or a mythic spiritual heroine. And like the empowered spiritual heroine, the Navajo and the Tibetan must take the final step, the most dangerous one, of returning to the ordinary reality from which he or she had momentarily fled during the course of the chantway rite or tantric initiation. In the returning, one attains the first stage of the goal, a degree of body-mind integration, but it is only the first step in a lifetime process of spiritual renewal and growth, of finding within one's ordinary reality and helping others to uncover in theirs the ideal way of things. In the script of the night way, the one sung over his ideal alter ego, the dreamer, must reappear among his people from out of the holy people's beauty-filled sunbeam and rainbow-lit sky and perfect earth. Although he has already attained the faultless empowered mind state, Diyin, of the holy people, the dreamer must make the return on behalf of his people and to complete his own personal journey. Like the dreamer, so too must the one sung over continue his or her own spiritual journey beyond the period of the nightway rite for it to be a complete success. After the Kala Chakra Tantric empowerment is experienced, the initiate's ideal alter ego, as the child of the father, wheel of time, and the mother of diversity, begins a long process of acquiring enlightened wisdom that knows the empty nature of time and space, as well as developing a sufficiently purified body-mind for properly processing such knowledge. Like the Bodhisattva, whose qualities are carefully communicated through the words and examples of the the Lama, the, in, the initiate must now take this newly achieved awareness beyond the context of the Wheel of Time empowerment and integrate it fully into his or her daily existence and in a way that benefits others. Beyond Time and Form to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour, William Blake. Knowing that the journey into the holy state is possible only if one remains grounded in this reality, we can now take a look at the final understanding deriving from Navajo and Tibetan sacred ways of living. In the myth of the dreamer's reality, there is a de facto emphasis on timelessness and formlessness. The dreamer's journey takes place in the indeterminate past, one that is unfettered by conventional concepts of linear time. It is the mythic present, because Navajo conventional time is not linear but cyclic. Mythic episodes appear to us to be ambiguous in their order of occurrence, but in the liberated reality of myth, such ambiguity is normal, since there is no such thing as a proper sequential occurrence of events. Similarly, the power places visited by the dreamer during his timeless journey are, for the most part, unfindable. Chanters and anthropologists have tried to retrace the journey of the dreamer, but with little success. This, too, is as it should be, for it is not the physical place that inspires and informs one so much as the inner landscape that has at its basis the formless all-pervading. Holy wind, nilchi, holy wind, in turn allows the ultimate mind 
uh, is that is invested in all elements and forms, including Earth surface people, to know the beauty of the cosmos, Hozho. This knowledge enables the empowered spiritual heroine to return and be effective in a world that is steeped in time and space. In the Buddhist sense of things, time and space are at their basis, void, empty, of any independent existence. Yes, time and space are aspects of our ordinary reality. They seem to exist, relatively speaking, but they are only effects of a limited view and are not representative of the empty nature of reality. For the Buddhist, the true nature of reality lies beyond, in the perfect state of existence that is empty of all categories of description. It is the void, Tong Panyid Sunyata, where the ultimate and eternal one mind, Sangye Se, Buddha, permeating all phenomena, is fully revealed. It is the state that our seed natures of clear light, awareness, and immutable life wind seek to attain and in which they originate. This final understanding, derived through the heroic spiritual journey, is brilliantly developed in the Kala Chakra Tantra. As we know, the Wheel of Time teachings describe an outer reality, a macrocosm, in constant cyclic motion, the outer wheel of time. This is in synchrony with the parallel inner reality of cyclic movement of the energies and elements within one's body-mind, the microcosm, or inner wheel of time. To harmonize these and refine them into vehicles for developing the body-mind of enlightenment, certain psychophysical procedures must be followed, termed the alternate wheel of time. Like the deity Kala Chakra, these outer and inner systems have emptiness as their original nature. Thus, the metaphor for relative reality according to the Kala Chakra Tantra is cyclic time, with its fluctuations and rhythmic vibrations ranging from the vital breath of the individual body-mind to the Big Bang and black hole breathing cycles described as the growth and destruction of formed reality, the universe. During previous kalpas, world eons, the metaphor for the unformed emptiness of absolute reality becomes the timelessness and formlessness of things, or empty space. When the tantric practitioner or the Navajo visionary taps into the timeless aspect of the universe, timed reality is not negated. Rather, one reinforces the vitality of the other. As Lama Govinda taught, in this experience of timeless reality beyond the realm of, op of opposites, the relative is not annihilated in favor of the absolute, but the individual and the universe penetrate and condition each other so completely that the one cannot be separated from the other. They are as inseparable as time and space, and like these they represent two aspects of the same reality. Time is the dynamic aspect of the individual, and therefore incomplete, action and experience. Space is the sum total of all activity and its ever complete and therefore timeless aspect. Lama Govinda's insights point to the deeper meaning of Kala Chakra, Tunki, Korlo. Kala and Tun uh, both refer to the conventional time, as well as to the Tantra's desired effect of getting beyond time. Chakra and Korlo signify the physical phenomenon called wheel or circle and the wheel-like energy centers of the body through whose use comes the experience of the state of being beyond form, that is, space. <coughs> so another way of expressing this essential union is by re- translating the father and mother deities' names as the Lord beyond the cycles of time and Lady Mother of Space beyond the diversity of forms. In the final analysis, our ordinary reality is one of timed form, whereas the reality striven for in daily transformative practice is the timeless formlessness of the ideal brought home to the real world of time and form. Obviously, it is now our turn to rethink time and space. Einstein demonstrated the inner workings of the relative aspect of the space-time continuum. But for insight into its absolute nature, we must turn to wisdom and methods preserved from ancient times. Perhaps when science manages to exhaust its dead-end slide through the material plane, 
and finally opens its tired inner eye, it may yet find the Tibetans and Navajos preserving their representative versions of this finest treasure of humanity. Then, by relearning these principles of the circle of the spirit and experiencing them in transformative ritual and a spiritual way of life, we too may yet discover peace within ourselves and in our world. In the wisdom of the past lies the hope of the future. You are rightly proud of your material culture, but you must not think peoples without it are necessarily uncivilized. Civilization and material culture are not one and the same. Your peasants have but few of the things your townsmen enjoy, yet they are no less civilized. They might indeed be more. It is a question of spiritual outlook. Rinchen Lamo, a Tibetan woman, speaking to the early 20th century British. The Anglo way of life is that of an industrialized society. It is very, very competitive. A white man easily becomes lost and lacks his identity in his computerized society. In the Navajo way of life, it is peaceful, independent, and truly a democratic society. Navajo Elder what it comes down to is simply this. If what the Buddhist, the Shoshone, the Hopi, the Christians are suggesting is true, then all of industrial technological civilization is really on the wrong track because its drive and energy are purely mechanical and self-serving. Real values are within nature, family, mind, and into liberation. Implicit are the possibilities of a way of living and being which is dialectically harmonious and complexly simple because that's the way. Gary Snyder. The religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend a personal God and avoid dogma and theology. It should be based on a religious sense arising from the experience of all things natural and spiritual as a meaningful unity. Albert Einstein. Tashi Shok, may all be auspicious. Hosho Nahaz Tzili'i, it is finished in beauty. Appendix 1, The Wheel of Cyclic Existence. The Wheel of Cyclic Existence, Sipai Korlo, is the model of a circular, actually spiral route taken by all unrealized sentient beings on life's haphazard journey into a state of peace, free from the sufferings of samsara's delusion. It depicts the six states of body-mind that are manifested through rebirth and that result from thoughts and actions generated in previous lifetimes. These are also the states of body-mind among which uh, we fluctuate uncontrollably during our every waking moment. D according to Buddhist understanding, we may become in this and previous future rebirths clockwise from four o'clock highly troubled hungry ghosts, deeply suffering hell beings, instinctively acting animals, uncontrollably jealous titans, demigods, in quest of the fool's paradise of blissfully ignorant samsaric gods. And finally, we may take rebirth in a sixth state of body-mind, that of human beings, in a sense a blend of them all. But unlike the other five, humans are said to have more ready access to the spiritual teachings that can lead us off the carousel of rebirths in cyclic samsaric existence and into the union with the void. The innermost circle depicts the three main poisons that fire one's ego and allow these various rebirths to take place. The cock of desire, the snake of anger, and the pig of ignorance. Depending on the strength of one's awareness and compassion in battles with these denizens of delusion, one can be led off the wheel by the Lama teacher and into Buddhahood, or dragged along by the hell beings of one's own creation. This process is seen in the next ring outward from the three poisons. On the wheel's edge, which is the clutches of Yama, Lord of Death, are twelve compartments that unfold a chain of events in a clockwise movement. The first, at one o'clock, is a blind man symbolizing the blindness of the spirit, primordial ignorance, which presses our karmically stained pure consciousness into uncontrolled rebirths. Next comes a potter fashioning our vessels, but elemental impulses which give rise to dualistic awareness signified by a monkey playing with a fruit. 
two being in a boat comprise the pitfalls of a personality's heart and views, the applying to phenomena of names and forms, six empty houses are the five ordinary senses, and the sixth mind arising from the sense and mental faculties, two people holding hands is the icon of the arousal of sense desires, a man with arrows in both eyes, equated with the result and uh, feelings of pleasure and pain, drinking indicates the first developed for more and more uh, sensations. Another man snatches at a fruit. He is grasping out of uncontrollable hunger. A man and woman sleeping together signifies the karmic length of procreation. Childbirth becomes a vehicle for rebirth of another consciousness. Finally, a corpse is taken away for disposal. Death yields future rebirths. But as is shown above the cycle to the left, there is a way off the wheel along a rainbow trail into the Buddha fields floating beyond. It is the way of cessation of suffering, nirvana, and final union with the void, the front of the infinite symbolized by Opame Amitabha, Buddha of Boundless Light. Appendix 2 Tibetan and Navajo Models of the Sacred World Offering Mandala The cosmic mountain is the perfect model for as close to an ideal reality as can be conceived in terms of earth and sky. As such, it is suitable creation for offering symbolically to divinities and respected teachers at the beginning of a Buddhist ritual. This practice is called Offering Mandala. Mandala can be offered in three ways. The first practice uses a handheld or larger conical construction of metallic or beaded rings set upon a mound of rice grains, colored beads, coins, and even jewels. This is a vivid visual and tactile representation of an entire world reality replete with wonderful things. One can also offer mandala more simply by interlocking figures, a representation of Mount Meru, and the four continent clusters is created. The third form of mandala offering, according to the tantric or diamond path, is the most subtle and personal. It is totally composed of one's mental and physical qualities. Here, the cosmic mountain and four continents are imagined to be one's spinal column, head, and four limbs. And as riches, uh, one offers one's very awareness and vital energies. All three levels of mandala are offered as a means of respect towards the outer, glowing forms of the Buddha, one's lama, and the tutelary deities, or yidams. It is given as a wish for attaining their minds and states of being, and it also is offered to their light and energy, which are simultaneously operating within oneself. But all these mountainous methods and representations are meaningless unless a true personal transformation takes place. One must visualize being at the center of a glorious mandala universe while giving it all up with total altruism and lack of, attainment, of attachment to the Buddha, one's Lama teacher, and the tutelary divinities. With this attitude and image fixed firmly in mind, the offering mandala proceeds in chanted fashion. Om Vajra Bhumi Ahum, here is the mighty and powerful golden base, here is its diamond hard fence, its outer ring is encircled by this iron fence, in the center rises Mount Meru, king of mountains, here is the eastern continent, here is the southern continent, here is the western continent, here is the northern continent, and their subcontinents. In the east is the treasure mountain. In the south is the wish-giving uh, granting tree. In the west is the wish granting cow. In the north is the spontaneous harvest. Here is the great precious wheel. Here is the great precious jewel. Here is the great precious queen. Here is the great precious minister. Here is the great precious elephant. Here is the great precious horse. Here is the great precious general. Here is the great precious treasure vase. Here is the goddess of beauty. Here is the goddess of garlands. Here is the goddess of song. Here is the goddess of dance. Here is the goddess of flowers. Here is the goddess of incense. Here is the goddess of light. Here is the goddess of perfume. Here is the sun. 
Here is the moon. Here is the umbrella of all that is precious. Here is the banner of victory in all the directions. In the center are all those possessions, precious to gods and to men. This magnificent collection is nothing that which I offer to you, my mind and holy teacher, together with your venerable predecessors. I particularly offer this universe to request the profound Mahayana teachings from your lips. The Hogan the Hogan is a fundamental symbol of the Navajo spiritual universe. It is simultaneously the physical shelter of the earth's surface people and the first Hogan of the holy people at the place of emergence, the primordial ground of the Navajo people. The first Hogan had a conical shape, preserved in the old-time male Hogan. As such, it is the place in which ceremonies were originally held. A second first Hogan was constructed at the central mountain of the Navajo geomantic universe. This was the prototype of the round, six- or eight-sided female Hogan, still in widespread use today. The Hogan home is sited structured and used geomantically. Every Hogan is oriented toward the east, the doorway facing the point where the dawn broke during the construction. Thoughts and people arise with the east white light. Likewise, from the east do the white wind of dawn and the blessings of beauty, Hozho, enter the Hogan's doorway. In the full sunlight of the southern sky, life progresses as its maximal pace. Accordingly, in the southern quadrant of the Hogan, the real work of the living takes place. Food preparation, arts and crafts, and repair work, and teaching of the children. In its western quadrant, intimate gatherings of the family and sleeping are the manifestations of the energy and qualities of thought and action of the twilight. The Hogan's northern quarter is associated with the dark, power-filled quadrant of the diurnal cycle and is the area where the family stores its material goods, where the children play, and where security for the future abides. According to the geomantic scheme, south is considered to be male and north female. When ceremonies take place in the Hogan, which is where they should only take place, men sit along the southern wall and women sit at the north. They seat themselves during a ceremony after having circumambulated the central fire inside the Hogan in a sunwise manner. All beings in the east and precedes sunwise all begins in the east and proceeds sunwise for the Navajo. This is exactly the manner of the Tibetans who enter a temple courtyard gate, ideally facing east, and circumambulate its holy precincts in a sunwise motion. The fire, source of life, sits at the center, actually skewed slightly eastward to give more living space away from the cold drafts at the door. Its elemental power is heat and, and heart of earth woman. Above it is an open smoke hole, the entrance into the domain of sky man. Both divinities and aspects of the Hogan signify the basic aspects of a world in beauty. The Hogan's universal scheme is so essential that it has been repeated in the very ground plan and architecture of Navajo Community College, located below the highest mountain range on the reservation and at the head of Sa'ile Creek, now a lake, which cuts one of the main canyons of Canyon de Chelly, home of the tutelary deities or Ye'ez. Administrative and Faculty Offices, a Native American Research Center, a Chanter's Hogan-shaped conference room, complete with earth floor and wood stove, and a museum and archives, all places of initiating thought, are situated at the east of the college's geomantic mandala. They are housed in a six-story glass, concrete, and steel Hogan. In the south are situated places of study and work, the essential activity of Navajo Community College, its classrooms and laboratories, and also shops for managing the college's physical plant and vehicles. To the west is the home place, student dormitories, shaped like hogans, each with 16 rooms and four entryways, always factors of four.
A fireplace sits in the middle of each, since the people sleep in the western part of their hogan, so too will the children of the people sleep in their hogans in the western part of the college's grounds. To the north are the college's facilities of physicality. In the traditional hogan, the family's goods are stored in this quarter. During breaks in a ceremony, the men play cards there. Children play there. It is the quarter where night and winter hold sway, the place of raw energy. As such, the gymnasium and student union building, with its same rooms and lounges, can be found in the northern quadrant of the campus. All is enclosed by a circular roadway. At the center of the geomantic circle are the college's energy sources. Its fireplace is a Hogan-shaped cafeteria, source of physical sustenance. Its source of mental nutrition is the circular Naaltsu's uh, Behogan, house of papers, i.e. library. The Hogan is all these things and more. It is the macrocosm in microcosm with no barrier, despite its walls and roof between them. The Mountain Earth Bundle. Before the first people disappeared from the fifth world, a major turning point occurred in Navajo history. The Great Mother came on the scene. Through the changing woman, Azza'a Nadle'ihi, she who rejuvenates herself, came specific divinities of this world and people to inhabit it. She created the Diné, or Navajo, as her children and heirs to the spiritual legacy of the first people, and she fashioned a sacred toolkit for them to keep the world in beauty. This kit was a sacred medicine bundle patterned after the one brought up from the fourth world by her guardian stepparents, first man and first woman. Through it, the future people would have a means of identifying with the ideal reality of the fifth world. The power-filled fifth world continues to be perfectly symbolized in today's Navajo reproduction of her sacred kit, called the Mountain Earth Bundle. The Blessing Way reveals that when Changing Woman made the prototype Mountain Earth Bundle, she used soil from the sacred mountains. Since the Mountain Earth Bundle was a gift from the Great Goddess and contains the energies of the Holy Peaks, their actual soil is contained within. It has become a most important mechanism for connecting the Earth surface people with the state of being of the Holy People. Contemporary Navajo call it our medicine and our mother. The Mountain Earth Bundle consists of two sacred buckskins. Four pieces are cut from one hide to serve as pouches that will contain soil from the four cardinal mountains. Clockwise, east to north, Blanca Peak, Mount Taylor, San Francisco Peaks, Hesperus Peak. Mixed in with each soil sample are powdered mirage and haze stones, which bestow the protective power of invisibility. Also, sprinklings of special life pollen are applied. Such pollen is created out of the partnership of the pure energy and communicative qualities of corn pollen and the unique vital force of different animals. Thus, if a living bluebird is momentarily sprinkled with pollen and then allowed to shake it off, the collected pollen contains those qualities of clear insight and good fortune that are bluebird, the bird of the dawn in East Mountain. In fact, life pollen from songbirds associated with each of the four sacred mountains are added to the soil samples. Likewise, pollen shaken from masks or sacred implements during a previous ceremony, such as the highly empowered Ye'i masks of the Nightway, can be used. Each pouch is then tied together by a buckskin thong, and an identifying stone, a stone is sewed into each appropriate pouch of mountain soil white shell for East Mountain, turquoise for South Mountain, abalone shell for West Mountain, and black jet for North Mountain. In the center of the four pouches, which are arranged geomantically, a remarkable sculpted array is sometimes positioned. Enigmatically named the Talking Prayer Stick, it consists of two or more cylinders of mirage stone having male and female identities, that is, Sa'anagai boy and Bikehozho girl. It is quite probable, too, that they symbolize the paired central peaks described in the Blessing Way, Encircled Mountain and Spruce Mountain. Sometimes soil from the sacred mountain of one's area of Navajo land is placed in the bundle's center. All this is positioned within the second buckskin. Added to the bundle before it is closed are just as the Tibetan's offering mandala, jeweled and other special articles embodying the power and beauty of the cosmos. 
They include various mirage and haze stones and rock crystals. These give added life to the bundle. Likewise, one finds tiny carved turquoise, white shell, abalone, and jet figurines of game and domesticated animals scattered within to bless both the animals and the users of the bundle. The ends of the buckskin are then gathered and tied with a thong. A white shell bead is sewn to the appropriate position along the pouch to identify where the East Mountain soil is situated within it. The mountain earth bundle is now ready for consecration. Like the Tibetan offering mandala, the mountain earth bundle is a microcosm of the universe. Along with songs and prayers, it aids the imagination in generating an ideal reality inside and about the person. It creates a sort of spiritual gravity that centers the person within an ordinary world turned ideal through its connection with first man and first woman, changing woman, the tutelary deities, and the powers of the cosmos at large. In the blessing ways right, the one sung over becomes intimately connected with the bundle and its power under the direction of the chanter or singer. Frank Mitchell explained the bundle's use. The singer gets up and stands over the one sung over for a blessing, pressing the bundle to the body, to the body from the feet up. After that, the singer places a pollen pouch against the bundle and keeping the pollen towards that one sung over, puts the two into the person's right hand. Prayers and songs then follow that ask the holy people for protection and blessing for the one sung over, as well as for all the people of the cosmos. Then, Frank Mitchell continues, at the end, pollen is placed in the mouth as a blessing for nurturing the vitality and mind lying within one, and you say, everything will be well, everything will be blessed, four times. Appendix 3, Enlightening Experiences the Tibetan oral and visual traditions are full of examples of the primal connection between light and mind, the rainbow body of Milarepa. It is said that an advanced yogin, saint, or bodhisattva can leave this reality at will by changing the body's state of vibration, transforming it into its subtle component of light and wind, known as the rainbow body. Tibetan tradition tells of Milarepa, the great medieval yogin saint who supposedly transformed into a rainbow body after a deluded monk fed him poison. Oral tradition explains that by passing into the void in this manner, he furthered the cause of the Dharma by providing a graphic example of its efficacy for attaining enlightenment along the diamond path. At his death, Milarepa's barely visible subtle body was said to have been seen simultaneously in all the places where he had meditated over the years. Then, amid glorious rainbows and other auspicious meteorological phenomena, his body dissolved into a rainbow, beginning from his feet and moving to the crown of his head. Thus attached to a cord-like rainbow, he merged with the infinity of the sky. This rainbow cord is called Mu, after the ancient Tibetan word for sky, and is a means of movement of a deity or divine god-king between heaven and earth. The place of transit of such suns of the sky is generally the most sacred peak in a given region, usually the site of the rainbow and sunbeam-lit palace of the Yula, the protector warrior god of the region. This concordance is carried down to the most intimate level in which the crown of one's head is considered the site of the personal protecting Yula. Once all of the ancient kings of the Yarlung Valley permanently possessed such rainbow cords at the crown of the head, which retracted their bodies into the sky at the time of death. But after one king, Drigum by name, was tricked into serving his own cord during a battle, into severing his own cord during a battle, subsequent kings, now historical no longer mythic, have had to be born and die upon the earth, the diamond being. At the heart of tantric practice are visualization exercises for harnessing the powers of the imagination in order to create, merge with, then embody the bodily actions, speech, and mind of an ideal being. One of the most empowering of Tibetan tantric practices is identifying with the diamond being, Dorje Sempa Vajrasattva. We visualize the diamond being seated at the crown of our heads. 
he sits in lotus position, is composed of white, actually transparent light, glowing like a diamond. His left hand, resting on his thigh, holds a golden bell of transcendent wisdom. In his right is a dorje, the diamond thunderbolt scepter of incisive spiritual skill. He smiles gently and is sublimely beautiful. At this point, we affirm before him that we've generated negative actions, expressions, and thoughts during the course of our lives and resolve never to fall prey to them again. With firm faith in the effectiveness of the practice, we visualize that the light from the hundred-syllable mantra spinning as a wheel in his heart, which is radiating out to the, Buddhist of the, universe, the Buddhas of the universe and returning their light to him, drops into us through the top of the head, and our material body becomes luminous. We visualize all our negative emotions, physical sickness, and mental obscurations, all our bad karma and habitual dispositions, as passing out of us in the forms of blood and pus, dark smoke, horrible insects, and spiders, all of which satisfy the lords of karmic debt who wait hungrily below. The light from the deity's form and from the holy power of the Buddhas radiates through one's body in the visualization, and through the powers of the imagination it dispels all the negatives accrued in the course of living. Appendix 4. Harnessing Protective Powers Spiritual heroism requires knowing when and how to apply one's powers and insight toward cutting through obstacles to balance, peace, and happiness. Heroism can take the form of applying pacifying measures to a situation, but most commonly it requires the wise and judicious use of protective and destructive powers. Tibetans and Navajos recognize that thoughts, utterances, and actions create reality, but when they are unenlightened or faulted, negative results, call them obstacles, inevitably arise. When these obstacles are most severe and threatening, they possess the blackest of power and become a danger to one and all. Understanding this, both traditions recognize that at times it may be necessary to take extreme measures to fight fire with fire. Adverse situations may require the application of terrific countermeasures. With the advent of Buddhism in Tibet, great spiritual masters harnessed and transformed the raw forces of the cosmos to serve the new world view. Earth powers were ritually pacified, bribed, captured, or vanquished, as appropriate to their qualities, into becoming benevolent protectors of the new religion. Padmasambhava was the most famous of these spiritual davids. He was the tantric master par excellence of the Tibetans and of cultures scattered along the Himalayan watersheds. In order to dispel obstacles to the new view of reality, he is said to have emanated into eight major guises according to the energy needed for the task at hand. These ranged from the teacher's guise of Guru Rinpoche to the blood-curdling ferocity of Dorje Drolu, an aboriginal-styled deity with bared fangs, holding a thunderbolt scepter or a ritual dagger or purba. In these different personas, he instructed, bribed, attracted, or destroyed demons, ghosts, and major aboriginal divinities, sealing by oath the willing ones as protectors of the new Buddhist path. Padmasambhava is, said by, is by no means the only persona in the Tibetan pantheon for dispelling obstacles to enlightenment. Several marked transformations of peaceful deities readily come to mind. Consider Chen Rezi, boundless love. He embodies the totality of enlightened compassion. As such, he is generally shown in his emanation as a four-armed, placid youth, or as a still peaceful but active thousand-armed divinity. He is, however, identified with one of the most unspeakably ferocious, terrifying, and bone-chilling protectors, the great black one, Nagpo Chenpo Mahakala. Whatever quality of boundless love is required, Chen Rezi has an aspect that is appropriate to the task at hand. And in this guide, he is invoked and visualized by the practitioner. Likewise, he we may encounter the all-embracing quality of transcendent wisdom in the form of a peaceful, youthful deity bearing the flaming sword of wisdom that cuts through various mentally created obstacles to enlightenment. The Bodhisattva Transcendent Wisdom, <coughs> Jambayang Manjushri, is one of the, and the same with the deliciously repulsive slayer of the god of death, uh, Jigye Yamantaka. 
but the death that he dispels is the psycho-spiritual death trance induced by our most ignorant thoughts, expressions, and actions. His fiery halo is but a more incandescent form of the flame at the tip of uh, Jambayang's sword of transcendent wisdom. One more fierce emanation of an enlightened being requires an attention. He is the thunderbolt bearer, Chaknadorje Vajrapani. First and foremost, he is the embodiment of a Buddha's skilled ways and means, enlightened willpower. He is rarely shown in a peaceful guise. His wild, his wildly postured figure, haloed in flames, eyes bulging, dressed in a kilt of wildcat skin, and holding a thunderbolt scepter in his outstretched hand, more appropriately suits his conquering qualities. In one form, he is visualized as flying through the sky on the back of a great eagle, Chakyung Garuda, the Thunderbird of Aboriginal Asia, which holds a Lu serpent in its mouth. He rains down thunderbolts, scepters, and purbas of, meteor, uh, of meteoritic metal for the protection and fertility of all beings and worlds. Navajos use similarly strong imagery to symbolize their powers of protection. When Navajos require all-conquering protective energy, they may intone prayers and chants to the four great thunder beings and their unity, Big Thunder. Like the Thunderbolt Bearer, these holy beings are wielders of the raw energies of the Sky Realm. They are the thunderous sound, the lightning rain, and black clouds, all components of thunderstorms. In figure 158, various forms of lightning and flint arrowheads issue from Big Thunder. Lightning and arrowheads use the Navajo equivalent of Chakna Dorje's, uh, Dorje's and Purba's. The thunderer is crowned with a triangular thundercloud array. Snake and lightning, like rain, falls from the ends of his wings, while zigzag lightning surrounds him. This idea of finding balance by harnessing the fierce power of the thunderers is vividly illustrated in important Navajo teachings, describing how the adolescent twin sons of Changing Woman embarked upon their journey of empowerment to their father, the sunbearer. The twins set off toward the rising sun to gaze the gain the necessary strength, skill, and protective powers to vanquish the hordes of monsters that threatened the people. Their journey saw dangerous encounters with these anti-beauty powers of earth and sky, until they arrived on a rainbow pathway at their father's eastern home. In this classic journey of the spiritual hero described in the Navajo warrior's preparation rite, the twins met the sunbearer's dawnland wife, or sometimes daughter, who was fearful fearful for the boys' lives given Sunbearer's wrathful attitude toward outsiders. She hid them in Sunbearer's glorious celestial hogan, but they were quickly discovered by him on his return from his uh, life in the land of evening twilight. The father was at first disbelieving of his son's claims of kinship and forced them to endure potentially fatal tests of their authenticity, such as burning, freezing, and poisoning. They passed these by using power objects given them by helpful tutelaries encountered during their journey. Once the tests were passed, Sunbearer and his wife molded the bodies of the boys into more manly forms. They were now almost ready to return to the Earth's surface realm and dispel the most ferocious of the monsters standing in the way of the Navajo's ancestors' well-being. But to become fully protected and empowered, the twins were dressed by Sunbearer in flint armor, black for the older twin, blue for the younger. They were imbued with lightning power and handled powerful lightning bolt weapons by the great thunderer, uh, lightnings, thunderers of the four directions who had been summoned by Sunbearer for the purpose. When the older twin received his black flint armor, black signifies the fierce power of the north, one of destruction and protection, and weapons of zigzag lightning. He was also given his adult name, Monster Enemy Slayer, Naaye'e Ni'izagani. When the younger Navajo warrior twin received his blue armor, he took on the quality of blueness, According to the Navajo rainbow of spiritual colors, blue is the follower color of black. Blue is the color of nurture and helpful watchfulness. It is the warming, life-giving sun at its zenith in a clear blue sky, whereas black is the long, dark night at the sun's nadir. Along with his blue armor, the younger twin received a bundle of flash or straight lightning as his weapon and the maturity named Childborn for Water. 
Toba Jishchini in recognition of his mother's impregnation by a stream from a waterfall. The fiercely protective power of blackness darkness has been evoked by the Navajo in some of humanity's most terrifyingly beautiful ritual poetry. Consider the song of the black bear. My moccasins are black obsidian, my leggings are black obsidian, my shirt is black obsidian, I am girdled with a black arrow snake, black snakes go up from my head, with zigzag lightning streaming out from the ends of my feet I step, with zigzag lightning streaming out from my knees I step, with zigzag lightning streaming from the tip of my tongue I speak, now a disc of pollen rests on the crown of my head, gray arrow snakes and rattlesnakes eat it, Black obsidian and zigzag lightning stream out from me in four ways. There they strike the earth. Bad things, bad talk do not like it. It causes the missiles to spread out. Long life, something frightful I am. Now I am. There is danger where I move my feet. I am black bear. When I walk where I stop, lightning flies from me. Where I walk, one to be feared I am. Where I walk, long life. One to be feared I am, there is danger where I walk, or flint sa'an nagai. Consider this reworked excerpt of the black bear snake prayer. On earth coming from the points of big black snake's feet, knee, body, hand, lips, and head, black flint together with lightning stands as a shield for me. Black flint with your five-fingered shield moving around, with this keep fear away from me, keep the fearful thing away from me, Hold it and stop it, black flint, the power you possess in your medicine pouch. At the point where the black snakes meet the cross, put up a shield of protection in front of me. I'll be safe behind it, then I'll be safe. Behind this the fearful thing will not reach me, will not get me. The fearful thing did not reach me, the fear missed me. I am the one who saved from the fearful thing behind it. I, uh, All of us are saved from the fearful thing behind it. Each one of us is saved from the fearful thing behind it. The fear missed us, the fear missed us. We are saved, we are saved. I am glad, I am glad. Pa. The expletive pa is an energetic combination of universal uh, phenomena, um, meaning jettisoning outward. Consider the English word spit and the power of the breath. Together they convey the energy of dispelling, of breathing away an ambient evil. Tibetans have a similar prayer during the daily practices associated with the highest tantric tutelaries. In this excerpt, a powerful Heruka protector tutelary known as the Lord of the Brave Ones dispels all obstacles, external and internal, to one's practice by means of a resounding fat. Om, I prostrate to the Bhagavan Lord of the Brave Ones. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you whose brilliance equals the fire that ends a great eon. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you who has an inexhaustible crowning topknot. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you who bared fangs in a wrathful face. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you whose thousand arms blaze with light. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you who holds an axe, an uplifted noose, a spear, and a skull staff. Hum, hum, fat. Om to you who wears a tiger skin cloth. Hum, hum, fat. Om, I bow to you whose great smoke colored body ends all obstructions. Hum, hum, fat. The bear and the snake are among the first echelon of protective powers in the Navajo pantheon. When the twins arrived at the eastern home of Sun Bearer, they had to make their way past his four sentries, Giant Bear, Big Snake, Thunder, and Big Wind, according to some Navajo Chantway lineages. There are four kinds of protector bears having the colors, east, south, west, and north, black, white, blue, and red, red being a color of danger and power. The black, actually gray bear, is widely invoked by Navajos as a source of protective power, especially in cases where ill will and even witchcraft prevail. I once participated in such a protective ceremony. The cause of the danger was a situation of mistrust and conflict between Navajo workers in a tribal agency and its administrator. Such an ambience of anti-beauty is highly destructive to the mental and physical well-being of Navajos, and a delegation of the employees was dispatched to a chanter to have something done for them, that is, a protective ceremony. 
The impromptu rite took place in an isolated mountain cabin and lasted well into the early hours of the morning. The chants, prayers, and ritual procedures connected the employees to several protective powers. These included the vanquishing powers of the black bear, externally symbolized in a tiny sculpture of a bear made from black jet, the jewel of the north. The energies of the warrior twins, present in various prehistoric flint knives held by each participant, and the invisibility to evil characteristic of the Mirage people. In this case, we applied crushed Mirage stone to our faces. The same kind of potent protective energy is spelled out vividly in visualizations of protectors of the Tibetan religion, such as the protector of the carnal ground, Xing Kyong, uh, Kishestrapala. He is a dark blue, almost black emanation of the most important terrific protector of the religion, the Great Black One. As the symbol of boundless love's tough love, the Great Black One is the kind of wisdom energy needed when compassion must become terrifyingly stern, so as to vanquish evils and sufferings brought on by egocentric delusions. In monasteries throughout Tibet, monks ritually invoke tough love, if I may use this name for the Great Black One. Each month, by means means of percussive chants, booming horns, drums, and cymbals, recited praises and prayers, visualizations and offerings. Tough love is so important to the Tibetan mind that he is considered to play a crucial role in maintaining world peace. Paralleling the Great Black One is the greatest of Tibet's female protectors, Paldin Lamo, the glorious goddess. She is the equal of the Great Black One. One, uh, but her innumerable emanations and qualities of fiercely protective motherhood place her in a class by herself. The glorious goddess is the special protector of the Dalai Lama and of the Tibetan state. A brief description hardly does her justice. She is the ultimate wrathful mother galvanized into a fierce frenzy of protective energy, much as a mother bear would summon to protect her cubs. Only clear light minds and candidates for future enlightenment are Paldin Lamo's cubs. Paldin Lamo has a fierce dark blue hue and hides a light blue wind ass with a third eye in its rump. He is befra uh, befanged with three glaring bloodshot eyes and a tiara of five skulls signifying the five primordial delusions. In her right hand is a trident-topped staff, in the left a blood-filled skull. She wears a tiger-skin kilt and has a human skin over her shoulders, which with the skull signifies impermanence. She is also adorned with, flesh, with freshly severed human heads and ev enveloped in snakes. She has a moon glowing from the crown on her head and a sun glowing at her copulent navel. She sits on a... Um, on, at her corpulent navel. She sits on a saddle made from the skin of a cannibal and the reins are snakes. Hanging from the saddle are a skin bag full of poison or disease and two dice for divining one's fate. The protectress and her mount are haloed in an aura of flames while they ride through a sea of menstrual blood. Terrifying? Yes. Evil? No. She is a graphic embodiment of the power, ambient in the cosmos and existing within the body-mind that dispels obstacles to enlightenment. A brief description should be made here of one other Tibetan protector. He is named Pehar or Trinlig Yalpo, King of Activity, and with Paldin Lamo he completes an essential male-female protector pair of the Tibetan nation and its religion. Known as the Tensung Marnag, the red-black protectors of the religion. Pehar resides in the northern quarter, the place of fiercest energy of the mandala of the five embodied kings, Kunga Gyalpo. He is managed at Nichang Dorje Dratsang, Tibet's state monastery. Pehar is visualized as living in a uh, palace of turquoise and having the demeanor of a great man with six arms and three heads, with faces colored white, sky blue, and red. In his hands he holds various weapons for accomplishing his protective activities on behalf of the people and their religion, a hooked iron axe, bow and arrow, sword, knife, and club. Wearing a kilt of a tiger's skin, he rides upon a white snow lion. Surrounding him is a halo of flames. A more accessible subsidiary emanation of this aboriginal warrior god is Dorje Drakten, the renowned Thunderbolt, who is red-skinned and dressed in the armor of a warrior of old.
Dorje Drakten appears in the midst of the Tibetan people in human form through the medium of body bases of a monk at Nichang Monastery now re-established in exile at Dharamsala, India. This is the Nichang Oracle. He serves as the state seer, advising the Dalai Lama, his government, monasteries, and occasionally individuals. The rather violent trance that the Nichang Oracle undergoes vividly uh, reflects the fierce power of Dorje Drakten Pehar, who with Paldin Lamo provides for the protection of the Tibetan way of life. The Dalai Lama once discussed the use of the energy of hatred and other afflictive emotions on the tantric path to enlightenment. He explained that with heartfelt compassion as one's underlying motivation, hatred or wrathfulness can be used to defeat itself. The technique is based on the fact that when we become angry, a very energetic and powerful mind is generated. This power can be harnessed to achieve a fierce kind of enlightened activity. This state of body-mind is symbolized in the images and qualities of the terrific wrathful deities. In this sense, one harnesses the most terrifying form of duality in the service of unity. Knowing when then harnessing and uh, knowing then harnessing enemy energies as a source of goodness lies at the heart of the transformative work of the Tibetans and Navajos. Let us now consider the Navajo concept of enemy energies and how to dispel their effects. The monsters that had threatened the fifth uh, world reality were material na'aye'e or enemies. They were either killed outright or somehow stopped from pursuing their negative ends by the warrior twins. But there is a more subtle and pervasive kind of enemy that afflicts the Navajo body-mind. This enemy is called the evil or the spell. It is both the essence and the agent of Hoxko, anti-beauty. It is a force of darkness, illness, chaos. It may be humanly generated either by an ignorant action or statement by an individual, more deliberately by a skinwalker which whose spell is delivered with calculated malevolence. This form of na'aye'e can wreak a great mental and physical harm, such as illness and even death, requiring that it be effectively warded off or destroyed at its source. The bear medicine protection ceremony described earlier was held to ward off the effects of such na'aye'e. During the course of the ceremony, each participant was made impervious to harm by means of two protective mechanisms, since the evil can be anywhere and affect anyone. The first protective mechanism was mirage stone. Its finely ground powder endowed the participants with a mirage-like body, making them invisible to the enemy energy. Likewise, earlier in the evening, each of us was given an ancient, large, and rather sharply napped stone blade to hold. This was our second protective mechanism. The blade symbolized the flint weapon and armor of the spiritual warrior, monster enemy slayer. It is the weapon of barbed zigzag lightning given him by the thunderers during his and his brother's initiation. One cannot help recalling the image of the thunderbolt bearer, the Tibetan's deity of the sky, rain, and body mind's willpower, who is said to rain down upon his enemies, obstacles to enlightenment, tiny thunderbolt scepters, dorjes, and ritual daggers, purbas, made from meteoric iron, the residue of lightning. It is no wonder that a major bar a barrier of protection in every Tibetan mandala is a ring of dorjes. Likewise, in the consecrated sand version of these mandalas, a ring of special purba ritual daggers are embedded around the mandala's outer periphery as further protection for its sacred inner precincts. Navajos similarly surround their sand, sand, uh, their sand paintings and official seals with flint arrowheads and lightning. And chanters also embed special feather wreaths, the spiritual arrows around their sand mandalas, for similar protective purposes. And no wonder, protection from evil is a major focus of Navajo religious life. It probably derives from a combination of recognizing the truly dangerous Bahazi'id nature of the powerful natural world and a history of skirmishes with other humans, particularly the mad white tribe of Anglo-Americans. Protection from evil is vividly demonstrated during ceremonies dedicated to exercising the ghosts of deceased people. 
a Navajo acquaintance working as a maintenance man at a hospital on the reservation once became most unsettled in mind. He was diagnosed by a traditional seer as having ghost sickness. Uh, he was seen to have become disturbed by the ghost of a deceased Navajo with whose body he accidentally had come into contact at the hospital's morgue. The diagnosed cure was a ghost way. The ceremony was held and, by acquaintance, uh, recovered his mental imposture. With his recovery, he began attending another main uh, main form of ghost exorcism ceremony, the enemy way. Since then, he has begun study to become an enemy way chanter. The enemy way, or anaji, is a grand exorcism rite reserved for Navajo who have come into contact with the ghost of a non-Navajo. It has served the Navajo particularly well in the case of warriors returning from battle, and it has retained its importance for returning Navajo vet veterans of international conflicts. This four-day summertime rite counters such symptoms as mental confusion, depression, and bad dreams that result from pollution by the wandering and angry ghost of a deceased adversary. This is the very same ceremony that the warrior twins had done for them after ridding the fifth world reality of its enemy monsters, see Appendix 5. Navajo chanters and philosophers know that while a ghost has a subtle physical basis, it is a kind of residue of the deceased. It is also something mental. For the Navajo, all experience is the result of thought and its energy of manifesting things, which is speech. If you think it and say it, then it will come to be. Similarly, Tibetans very much become their visualizations and mantras, their mental and speech projections. But this ability to readily harness and experience the powers of body, speech, and mind is a double-edged sword for the Navajos and Tibetans. It is my impression that they are subject to the most subtle stimuli and must take proper protective measures. If a Navajo has experienced too much of the suffering and death of others, albeit of enemies, that person may become haunted by the energy memory of his experience. Nightmares and loss of weight, appetite, physical strength, and mental health may ensue. The ghost of a Na'aye'e may be responsible, so its grip must be effectively severed through a ritualized psychiatric procedure. Thus, an enemy way is indicated. Navajos do not name such psychophysical afflictions other than calling them ghost sickness, lightning sickness, and the like. For them, uh, illness is not caused by some germ or foreign body, but by a total disruption between the body-mind and the cosmos. The offending ex external object is but an agent and a symbol of this lack of beauty. Tibetans take this understanding one step further, since the state of being out of balance with the cosmos is derived from the being out of balance within one's own body-mind. Noticeable projections of this imbalance will materialize in one's mind and life's material experiences. The Gyusi, the fundamental tantric medical text, calls these projections ghosts and demons, while their effects are called dawn. Such demons are actually projections of one's own state of mind and of the state of the psychic nervous system's subtle winds and energies. Given the Tibetan penchant for analyzing, classifying, and describing spiritual phenomena, the Gyuji lists some very vivid life-generated demons indeed. These body-mind obstacles are part of a larger uh, panorama of dangerous power beings that permeate the world of power and sentience. Tibetans attribute misfortune and illness to ambient powers that had been organized into a nine-part pantheon during pre-Buddhist times. Since, like the celestial dwelling La and the Lu, who inhabit the Earth's watery realms, are sometimes fierce but potentially beneficent entities, others, such as the Du and Mu, who live in the Sky Realm, can be extremely damaging. Uh, the Sin are fierce water dwellers, while the Noichin, uh, Tsen, Te, and Dre inhabit the Earth's surface reality, but often extend into the upper and lower realms. These latter powers are extremely fierce and destructive. They therefore require various forms of placation rites, ranging from offerings to exorcism. Tibetans maintain daily balance with these powers by wearing special protective amulets known as Sungdu around their necks. 
Placed inside these cloth or metal containers are handmade prayers with woodblock uh, printed images and invocations that serve as charms to ward off uh, harmful instant influences. Similar woodblock printed images are hung on doors of homes and monasteries to ward off attack by malevolent powers.